Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community, Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Ableton On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition, Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Able Then On Air has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Ableton On Air is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to this edition of Ableton On Air, the one and only program that focuses uh, on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I've always been your host, Lauren Seiler. Sorry that Arlene could not be here today. Uh, before we begin our wonderful show and talking to our guest, uh, Daniel Molin from Enough Ministries, we would like to say uh, special thanks to our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many, many others, including the support and um, the partnership with Enough Ministries for today's program and the Division for the Blind of Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, and Higher Abilities of Vermont. Thank you, uh, Daniel Molin from Enough Ministries uh, of Barry for joining us on this edition of Able to Learn And thank you You're to welcome. your uh, wonderful companion, uh, Ransom, there uh, yep. for joining us. Um, um, so, let's um, start. Um, tell me a little bit about your challenge. Um, you've been in the military, and let's start there. Yeah. Um, you know, I um, served in the military for 32 years, um, retired as a, as a colonel. I've done combat tours in Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and I am currently 70% disabled, according to um, the VA. Um, so, you know, obviously in ministry, we need to rely on the Lord to, to make up the, the rest of that and rely on His strength, and He has been um, so awesome in uh, enabling me to do so much uh, in our ministry and for the local community. So Okay, so let's... Uh, talk about Enough Ministries. Uh, mm. What is Enough Ministries? What is the missions and goals of Enough yeah. Ministries? So Enough Ministries was planted um, more than eight years ago now. Um, Enough Ministries was originally um, planted as a church for the uh, homeless addicted in Hungary in uh, Barrie. Um, and we know that you know that is a unfortunate, uh, unfortunately large population um, in Barrie, and so um, we have a number of uh, sub ministries within the organization that we assist people with. We have a food distribution ministry, we have a soup kitchen ministry, and a clothing ministry. 
Um, and we've also just started a, um, it's called Celebrate Recovery, which is an addiction recovery uh, ministry as well. So um, that's what we do. Um, we take our name from uh, the Bible first that says uh, Jesus is enough, God is enough, and uh, he is sufficient for all of our needs, and that's why we come up with uh, enough ministries um, and, um, yeah, we've been, I think, um, a, um, uh, a staple within our community for, for helping people with all sorts of, you know, kinds of issues and, and whatnot and just, uh, showing them God's love. When you say, uh, addiction and mental health, and mm -hmm. that's a large population in Barrie, hmm. um, can you go through that particular thing? What, uh, why is it a large uh, population? population? I know during, I know during the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, mental health has been an issue. So yeah. can you talk about that yeah. for a little bit? So um, I, you know, I do believe that, um, and the statistics will bear out that um, a large percent of the population that's homeless, addicted, and hungry. Um, also um, suffer from some sort of mental health, you know, kinds of issues, social anxieties, um, you know, um, and other kinds of schizophrenias and, and whatnot. And that's unfortunate. Addiction, you know, is also a part of it. So there's a, uh, a mental health and physical health component that underlies a lot of that. I don't think that anybody would desire to be homeless. Mm -hmm. um, or addicted or hungry mm -hmm. um, and so it's something else that sort of brought them to that point um, you know perhaps they weren't able to afford you know some sort of health care procedure or whatever and and that caused them to lose their housing or um, you know they have some sort of uh, mental health challenges that um, make it difficult for them to work or stay in certain sort of situations or follow rules and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so, yeah, I do think that, um, you know, we have a large population in Barrie. Um, I think there's a large population everywhere um, that is largely sort of unseen. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of, um, for example, uh, prescription drug abuse that goes on everywhere that it's addiction whether you have a job and you're a functioning addict or you're a non-functioning what do you addict mean by a well. functioning addict if you don't mind so me you're that. i guess you know the definition for a functioning addict would be somebody who's who's addicted uh to a drug but also they're capable of um you know performing a job or you know maintaining a family or whatever so um the fact that you're able to uh, continue life at least for a while in that addicted stage isn't um, isn't to say that your addiction is any less than somebody who's on the street and um, you know um, however they're raising money for you know drugs or whatever and uh, are homeless. Now, God is an able God. We know Amen. This. Yeah. Um, do you think, in your opinion? Um, now you have alcoholism, drugs, mm. opioids. Well, is there uh, now? There are different types of counseling. Mm -hmm. Is there a different type of counseling, or, or is Christian counseling, or religious counseling, or a person who is religious to help counsel? Is that better than seeing a regular quote unquote counselor of the secular world? So I, I think... Um, Am I saying that right? Yeah, I, I um, went, I have a master's degree in, in uh, counseling um, from... You have Johnson. three master's degrees. I have three master's degrees. One of them is in, is in counseling, um, which is really Christian counseling. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in order, you know, that was my specialty. In order to do that, you learn a lot about secular counseling as well, and you need to know... Um, some of the foundations of secular counseling as well in order to, um, you know, receive insurance payments and be, uh, become a certified counselor and whatnot. 
Um, but uh, I think if you boil it all down, there's one sort of distinct difference, and that is when you go to a secular counselor, if um, I went to a secular counselor and I said, hey, you know, I'm looking at breaking up with my wife and, you know, um, I just don't find her very attractive anymore, whatever, and, you know, my girlfriend, um, you know, is asking me to move in and should I move out of my house and in with the girlfriend, secular counselor would probably take a tact and say, well, what makes you most happy? You know, what, what, where is it that your, your heart lies and um, sort of encourage you to, um, you know, follow through in that path? Where, as a Christian counselor, there's um, a biblical set of uh, morals and ethics um, that are codified in the Bible. And when somebody would come in and say, hey, I'm looking at lose, leaving my wife to see this other woman, we would say, well, wait a minute. Uh, the Bible says that, um, you know, we, we don't do that. And so the line of counseling would be, even though that might make you more happy, let's work on the relationship that you're currently in. Mm. Um, and so there's, you know, sort of a different philosophy. Um, I think, um, you know, Christians understand that this is a fallen world. It's not perfect. Um, there is going to be disease and suffering and, you know, that kind of thing in this world. Um, and, um, you know, God has um, some truth for us, has uh, an ultimate reward for us for um, following through in his commands. And so, mm. you know, we'd be encouraging people to, um, to follow up with, with those commands. Um, so again, let's... Uh, Let's talk about, you know, because we, we focus on abilities of people on the show. Mm. Um, you know, and everybody has an ability, especially to break out of mm -hmm. addiction uh, mm -hmm. and other things. But uh, um, how has, and, and we're going to go through some specific examples. Mm. Jesus Christ mm. came down in the form of man. Mm -hmm. Okay. He became disabled, if you will, and shown he was he shown the world how able he can be. Mm. How has media played a part in uh, showing the Bible? Because you know the Bible is a big book, mm. and there's a lot of lessons. Mm. Go ahead. I, I think From that... From sp specific yeah, examples. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's obviously a number of different um, examples. I mean, you look at um, the popular series right now, which is called The Chosen. Mm -hmm. um, you might have seen that. Um, and there's certainly examples that go way back, you know. Moses in, in had media. a speech impediment. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot like, of yeah. a lot of uh, different examples of how the the media has, um, you know, portrayed the Bible. I think it tells us in the Bible that we shouldn't add one word or subtract one word from the Bible. I think that alone makes it difficult mm -hmm. to um, have an accurate portrayal of. Um, you know, what is codified as what we know is truth in the Bible. Um, I say that because, you know, you have a certain length of time that you're trying to do a movie uh, about whatever kind of an event. Um, and for, Is it biblically accurate, though? Are they... Like, well, th this is my point, that, mm -hmm. that it is hard to be 100% biblically accurate because there isn't enough material there to present a fully rounded sort of um, picture or storyline that um, lends itself um, to the Bible. Um, for example, um, you know, in the Ten early 1950s, they had the Ten Commandments, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Charlton Heston, you know, uh, did that. You know, he's, he's a great example, you know. We have a, a actor who is portraying Moses, um, one of the things that we know um, from Moses is that Moses was not 
eloquent in his speech. Mm -hmm. Charleston Heston is pretty eloquent in his speech. He's a good actor. Um, and so it's hard to portray a totally biblically accurate, you know, kind of um, story. Um, you know, sometimes things have to be left out because we only have so much time to tell the story. And so we start chopping things out as the, as the media does with any kind of story, you know, Top Gun, whatever. You know, they filmed a lot of stuff and a lot of it ended up on the cutting room floor. Um, so the question is, is when you film a movie like The Ten Commandments, Passion of the Christ, whatever it happens to be, um, some of that ends up on the cutting room floor. And some of that is scripturally significant. Like the and, scourging scene yeah. in, in Passion of Christ, before we show a clip, yeah. um, Isaiah 53 is, you know, he was wounded for our tr transgressions and our iniquities, mm. but when we look at the scourging scene, mm. that's, it was, it was, it was hard to watch. Mm -hmm. it, you know, people were crying in theaters. People, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, ripping skin, uh, mm -hmm. welts, all mm -hmm. kinds of uh, things that mm -hmm. he endured. Um, uh, that was accurate, I'm assuming, because of what it says in the Bible. Well, it tells us that he went through, you know, um, that. Um, we we can surmise from what is written in the Bible that um, he, meaning what that exactly? we can assume, you know, that um, the Romans, when um, they tortured him, um, used that similar devices and to the similar extent. Um, but I also believe that the Bible is, it's God-breathed, number one, mm -hmm. and God breathed those words to the people who wrote them down, mm -hmm. and that every word in there is significant. Mm -hmm. And I also believe that every word that's not in there is significant. So in other words... How so? In this, um, in this particular context, I don't think that it was necessary for um, God to explain the degree and sort of gory detail uh, mm -hmm. that his son suffered. Uh, it was enough to know that he suffered in silence um, and um, not to know, oh, you know, he, um, you know, his kidneys were damaged or he lost so much blood or, you know, what the details are. And in order to make a movie, right, The Passion of the Christ, all that sort of graphic detail was, was necessary. But I don't think it's necessary... Um, for us to believe in, in the personhood and in the godliness of, of Jesus mm -hmm. um, to be in there. So there's different things. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, that series, uh, Jesus of, of Nazareth. In 1977, and, yeah, and, um, which we'll show a clip. Yeah, uh, uh, NBC back in 1977 did this yeah. wonderful yeah. miniseries yeah. of all of these stars that came to do this movie. Mm -hmm. um, it, that's my personal favorite. I mean, Passion of Christ, yeah, but mm -hmm. um, it, it, because it, it told Jesus of Nazareth went through, mm -hmm. it went through the birth, it went through the part where King Herod turned, you know, it, it, it went through everything yeah. in the Bible in a yeah. better sense yeah. of... yeah. I mean, it is, it is um, interesting. I mean, you say, you, you know, that, and that series, I don't know exactly how long it was. It was broken was. up. It was, like, it was the, the, actual move, the actual TV movie is, yeah. is actually six hours, but six it was hours. Broken, yeah. broken up into a, segments. Uh, or, segments. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, I mean, even in six hours, um, to explain the whole personhood of Christ, there was stuff that was left out, you know. Like um, what, for example? So um, Satan's temptation in the wilderness was totally left out. Mm -hmm. um, another part that was totally left out that I thought was significant is 
um, the scene where Lazarus is being raised from the dead. Um, the, we know that the shortest verse in the Bible is Jesus wept. Um, you know, it's a pretty um, significant verse, even though it's the shortest verse, um, because it shows that Jesus had compassion on people, he, right? He didn't just come down as God to sort of judge people and to um, pass, you know, his opinion on people or whatever, or condemn people. Mm -hmm. It shows that, hey, you know, here is somebody that he cared about, who he loved, who is now dead. Even though he knew he was going to raise him from the dead, he still wept about that. I, I think that it uh, is significant because... But he also, it shows that mm -hmm. Jesus cares about us. But as know? far as compassion, mm -hmm. he also became angry mm -hmm. at times. Yeah. Especially the part of Jesus of Nazareth, you know, when people are selling things in the temple. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's one thing to have maybe um, in today's day and age a bake sale Mm -hmm. to raise money for the church mm -hmm. or a religious institution. Mm -hmm. But why did he get angry with, uh, as well as compassion? Why did he have anger? Well, uh, he, you know, I think all this is to show that he was fully human mm -hmm. as well as fully God. Um, he isn't a remote, unfeeling, un, untouched God. He... Um, desires to be in relationship with us. And whenever we're in relationship with somebody else, the things that we're going through have effect on one another. And um, certainly uh, he was, he demonstrated his strong relationship with the Lord and uh, often referred to his father and the temple being his father's house. Um, the, um, the command for the um, nation of Israel to um, have uh, animal sacrifices in order to atone for their sins and well, basically yeah, the Passover. Yeah, with the all, blood of the all the um, you know um, animal owners and whatnot were in the temple. There were money changers there because there were people from different countries and they had all set up an area that would normally be taken up. Uh, by people preparing to worship was now taken up by this commercialism of, you know, uh, well, you can, you know, be absolved of your sin just by this ox. This is a very fine ox. And, um, and I think that um, that is foreshadowing, you know, Jesus uh, scattered those people out of, out of the temple. Um, it says that uh, he sat there and constructed a whip um, you know, before he um, drove them all um, out of the temple. Um, and so certainly he had um, the ability to have a sort of a righteous indignation mm -hmm. and be like, hey, this is not appropriate in my father's house. Mm -hmm. um, I think it also points to the fact, you know, uh, occasionally I'll hear people say, well, you know, um, Jesus just wasn't known. In, in Israel, you know, they didn't have the media that we're talking about now to publicize the fact that, you know, Jesus was there and everything. But when you commit an act uh, such as driving out all of the uh, money changers and the animal uh, husbandry owners and the, yeah, I don't think <clears throat> probably there were any tax collectors there. There could have been. Um, but at any rate, um, that act during Passover was <clears throat> certain to attract a lot of attention. That was the big high holy days uh, in the temple, and there would have been people from, you know, throughout that region of the world that would have seen <clears throat> and heard and uh, been witness to um, what Christ was doing. And so, um, you know, the, he was not an unknown historical uh, you know, uh, character. Mm -hmm. um, uh, let's um, talk more about Enoch Ministries. Mm. Um, as um, uh, you had told me um, off air, um, Enough Ministries merged with another church. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Was that because of the pandemic? Uh, no. 
Um, so um, enough ministries <coughs> had grown rapidly uh, on Summer Street and Barrie. Um, we had originally started in a storefront, you know, location. And uh, we were doing our soup kitchen ministry and our clothing ministry and our food ministry and also church in essentially uh, one, one room. small building. One small, yeah, one floor of one small building. Um, and we um, grew large enough over time so that, um, you know, we sort of had standing room only. Um, and we had um, people who were coming were saying, hey, you know, um, I was running late and I knew my kids couldn't sit with me, so I decided to stay home or whatever. And we knew um, that we had to look for a larger facility in order to accommodate everybody. Um, and um, we looked for quite a while uh, to find appropriate rental space or to buy a space someplace. And um, finally, we approached um, the uh, First Baptist Church in Barrie, who has a wonderful building, and um, asked if we could um, rent space from them um, for the church. And that discussion uh, changed fairly rapidly to a merger discussion. Um, they were having some challenges with outreach and uh, tithing and other kinds of things, and um, it looked like it would be a good match. We could bring in some of the um, things that we were doing, and they could bring in some of the stuff that they were doing and make it overall uh, more... Uh, attractive to the community um, would extend our ability to to um, reach our community and um, support our community and um, also um, provide us an opportunity to be able to worship um, in a uh, larger space um, and uh, and frankly to to join together with both churches you know add to the size of the church and and uh, make it a, uh, a stronger entity instead of two sort of weaker entities to make one stronger entity out of the two. And, so between uh, so the two churches, uh, so how many people now uh, are part of Enough Ministries? More, so, more than 100? Or? So we run about uh, 75 on any given uh, weekend. Um, you know, we have in the rolls, I think it's somewhere around 150 or so members, um, but you know the tradition today is um, uh, Gallup polls tells us that uh, people consider themselves to be regular attenders at church if they attend twice a month. Um, so that's quite a change from the, sort of the historical. Hey, if you were a regular attender, you were there every Sunday, or at least more Sundays than you weren't there. And now it's sort of a you know our our culture is has um, gone to a point where it's like 50-50. So um, you know, we don't people... necessarily see the same people every every weekend. Uh, there's, you, you're still doing online services? We still do um, online. Uh, matter of fact, we had a, uh, a baptism uh, last Sunday, and um, the uh, mother of this child was in Florida, and she was able to watch the service online in Florida in real time. Um, we also had another feed that was going to Waco, Texas. We had a mission team come up from Waco, Texas this summer and um, poured into this young man um, before he decided to accept Christ. And so they wanted to be part of that baptismal service. So yeah, on Sunday, we were connected with Texas and Florida and a bunch of people in Vermont and other places around. Yeah. Um, so um, certainly the, the rise of streaming uh, and the ease of streaming has, has certainly supported churches. And we find people will, you know, check us out online first, see what it's all about and, you know, how the service goes and, um, you know, what's the music like and all that kind of stuff before they step in the door. So that gives them a an opportunity to sort of check things out safely before they come in. Okay, so um, two questions, um, getting back to, you know, people with special needs. Uh, hmm. um, what are the, um, what are the misconceptions 
Because uh, I asked this of all my guests, what are the misconceptions around people with special needs when people first meet them, you know, about being scared and all? And um, you being, you having challenges yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there is a anxiety um, amongst people who aren't used to um, being around others that have some kind of uh, disability. Um, you know, the, the reality is, is that we're all going to have some kind of disability sooner or later. I forget what the statistics are for hospitalization, but sooner or later, most everybody ends up in the hospital at one time or another for something. Um, uh, I believe the statistic um, that I last read um, in one of my counseling journals that is that 75% of all Americans will have a event in which they um, um, should, could um, uh, approach, um, you know, someone for mental health counseling in their lifetime. Do you, do you? So, you know, we're, we're reminded once again that this is not a, pro, a perfect world. This is a broken world and there are broken people in this world. Um, some there, are, are physically there... broken, some are uh, emotionally broken or mm -hmm. spiritually broken or um, other kinds of things. So, um, do you, since you say that, do you think people, sorry, do you think people, and mental health has been a big problem during the pandemic, do you think, uh, yes, do you think, yes, there could be more mental health counseling or a better way of approaching it? to help more people? So, um, you know, from, from my point of view and the people that I see, um, I think that the push to a lot of telemedicine has uh, both been helpful and hurtful. How so? Uh, helpful because it has allowed people to remain in touch with people who were getting counseling before, but through whatever reasons, be maybe a spike in COVID, whatever it happens to be, uh, transportation issues, whatever, um, that they can't um, come and meet. But it says also, it tells us in the Bible that we should not forsake meeting in public as some are prone to do. Um, so um, it, it's also, we, you know, we opened up the church as soon as we could post-COVID, even though there were a lot of restrictions about space and temperature and, you know, uh, questions beforehand and having to keep a ledger of who was there and all those kinds of things. But it was important for us to, uh, to do that because there are some things that you can't do sort of virtually. By yeah. uh, you, know, you, you can't lay hands on somebody and, and pray for them. You have a much more difficult time uh, understanding when somebody is in sort of uh, distress or, or pain. You know, it's easier to observe their body language when you're uh, physically present with them. Um, it's easier to ask them, you know, questions about, you know, accountability. How are you doing with whatever, you know, uh, substance abuse or alcohol or other triggering, you know, kinds of things when you're in fellowship one with another. If, if you neglect that opportunity to gather together, you lose out on a lot of the benefit, I believe. Um, you know, for some people who already have an established relationship with a counselor, then to go virtually probably has less effect. But for people who are initially seeking, um, you know, support and assistance, it's, it's very difficult. Um, you know, I know um, that a lot of the... Um, AA meetings and stuff went virtual and some of them are still ongoing virtual um, but it's you know it's hard to tell if you know somebody who's uh, at a distance on your computer smells of alcohol you know or or other kinds of substances um, or are really struggling in that way so um, so would you say that that for example I deal with um Epilepsy. So mm -hmm. during the pandemic, mm -hmm. a, a telemedicine, uh, uh, count, uh, you know, session with the, uh, with a neurologist mm -hmm. is really hard. They, mm -hmm. You know, they need to see you. They they mm -hmm. have to write down your medic. You know, uh, help you 
with more stuff. So yeah, yeah. I kind of understand that. Yeah, yeah. Ransom, when uh, we were going through his service dog training, was training with another dog who was a epilepsy uh, service dog, um, and so we're sort of familiar with that. The let's see, yesterday we had a professor from Norwich University come in um, in the engineering department who suffers from. Uh, epilepsy, and he has a uh, service dog as well to help him, uh, you know, alert when uh, he's going to have seizures and stuff. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, service dogs are hugely, hugely helpful. Um, you can't really effectively do any of that kind of training virtually. Online. You yeah. know, you have to, you know, you have to uh, be able to experience that. The trainer has to be able to help you through you know, the issues of, of training. Um, I, I think that there are a lot of real challenges, um, you know, with uh, the telemedicine concept, although it's better than not having any kind of access to service for sure. But The, the last question, well, uh, two, two last questions. Hmm. Since you have a service dog, how hmm. has it been working for you and do you really, do, do you recommend that for other people um, going through the same thing you are? And, and mm. If you want to talk about that. For yeah, I mean, uh, I think uh, I, I can only speak from my own yeah, experience and saying. from, you know, people that, that I meet. Um, but uh, service dogs are amazing. Uh, the service dog that was getting trained uh, with Ransom for um, the seizure would not only alert the owner that they were about to have a seizure, but also would curl up sort of underneath her neck so that when she was having a seizure, she didn't bang her head on the floor. And um, I observed a few seizures which were quite violent. And um, the dog, I, I assume the dog must have been very uncomfortable with this woman, you know, sort of thrashing around on top of the dog. And um, it was amazing, you know, protected her from, from injury. Um, you know, I think that, um, you know, that service animals can be quite significant. Um, the, the VA has, um, in the time that I've had my experience with the VA, the VA has really um, started to open up a much better understanding about mm -hmm. service dogs and their capability to help uh, service members in a whole variety of different um, situations. It's not uncommon um, when I'm at the VA to see um, other service dogs, you know, walking around the VA. It's, you know, it's, it's more of a sort of expected, you know, kind of uh, situation than an unexpected one. What are the future goals of Enough Ministries? Future goals? Um, you know, I would pray that we would continue to follow the lead of the Lord um, in what we're doing. We have um, a longstanding sort of uh, vision that we think that we have received from Him, which is to help uh, all the communities along the Route 2 corridor have a, uh evangelistic church that is uh, close to their community. And so, you know, at some point in the future, we'd love to have uh, another church in, in like Danville and St. Johnsbury and continuing out that way. Um, and so uh, we're just keeping our ear to the ground. Right now, um, you know, we're really involved with servicing our community. There's 370 something homeless people that are put up in local hotels um, around central Vermont. We have a food ministry to bring food and support to them. Um, there's been a lot of in, uh, economic impact and to- From what I understand, like for example, in Barrie, Good mm -hmm. Samaritan Haven, we can mm -hmm. mention them for a minute, mm -hmm. um, that you know, they're now taking old hotels, mm -hmm. you know, talking about homelessness, mm -hmm. took, taking old hotels and turning them into apartments mm -hmm. um, you know that's another issue that's huge mm -hmm. yeah i mean for i think for the first time um vermont is at a um a place 
where they're providing some services for a large portion, not all certainly, but a large portion of the homeless community. Um, and um, I would hope that in that they would use um, those resources to address the root issues of homelessness. Um, you know, I think homelessness is much more about not having a home for you to live in. Um, it's, it's about those underlying issues of, of mental health and abuse and trauma and, um, you know, uh, social anxieties and those kinds of things that keep people sort of perpetually locked in homelessness. So I do hope that they can help address those sort of issues. Mm -hmm. um, let's, last thing, um, let's talk about the food ministry you guys have and then go yeah. into your website. What, sure. So what is that about? So we have, uh, since we started, we had a, um, a small um, uh, food ministry, um, just a closet on um, Summer Street. And um, when we moved to our, our new place, we created a much larger uh, shelter um, for that, a shed that's beside the building. And we included the opportunity to do refrigerated and frozen foods as well. Um, and as the pandemic um, wore on, we gradually were able to increase the amount of food that we were helping uh, support uh, in our community. Um, today, we're doing about 500 pounds of food a day. Um, and that's to, in a- Today? Today, every day. Oh, okay. Yep, every day, uh, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Mm -hmm. um, we put um, out food for for people to take. And we've seen people, you know, drive up and play a brand new, you know, Ford pickup truck. And I've sort of been like, hmm, what, you know, what's going on? And have the guy come out and be like, hey, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to get some food here. You know, I've been laid off. I can't work right now. Um, the payments on my truck and my mortgage take up all of my unemployment and, uh, you know, my, my kids would starve if I wasn't able to come down here and pick up food and stuff. So it, um, it has had a significant impact on the, on the community to be able to provide uh, food. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Ableton On Air. For more information on, on Enough Ministries and their work, uh, you can go to www.enoughministries.org. That's www.enoughministries.org. And for more information on um, Able Then On Air, you can go to www.orcamedia.net. Uh, is there a number for Enough Ministries, or is it just a website? There's a, a website there that we um, answer. There's a variety of email addresses and phone numbers available there. We're also on Facebook at uh, Enough Ministries Barry um, on Facebook, and we can be reached there as well. Okay. From, again, for more information on Enough Ministries, www.enoughministries. Dot org. We would like to thank uh, Pastor Daniel Moland and Ransom for joining us on this edition of uh, Able Then On Air. We would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, and many others, including the Association for the Blind of, um, of Vermont, the Division for the Blind of Vermont, and Higher Abilities Vermont, uh, and also the Great Partnership with Enough Ministries of Barry. I'm Lauren Seiler. Arlene couldn't be here today. See you next time on the next edition of Able Then On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler. Major sponsors for Able Then On Air include Green Mountain Support Services, empowering people with disabilities to live home in the community. Washington County Mental Health, where hope and support come together. Media sponsors for Able Then On Air include Parkchester Times, 
Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, New York Parrot Online Newspaper, U.S. Press Corps Domestic and International, Anchor FM, and Spotify. Partners for Able Dinner On Air include Yihad of New York and New England, where everyone belongs, the Orthodox Union, the Division for the Blind and Visually Impaired of Vermont, the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, Central Vermont Habitat for Humanity, and Montpelier Sustainable Coalition. Montefiore Medical Center of the Bronx, Rose F. Kennedy Center of Bronx, New York, Albert Einstein College of Medicine of the Bronx. Abel Denonair has been seen in the following publications. Parchester Times, www.thisisthebronx.com, New York Pirate Online Newspaper, Muslim Community Report, www.h.com, and the Montpelier Bridge. Abel Denonair is part of the following organizations. The National Academy of Television, Arts, and Sciences, Boston, New England chapter, and the Society of Professional Journalists.